Hey, Carl, thank you. Uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, chapter on stratification. And that's how we distribute uh, resources in a society, the layers of society or the strata of society. And specifically, I'm going to cover the concepts of caste and class and relate that to a classic 1940s study by W. Lloyd Warner that helped set up the class system that we study, uh, method of classification. And then I want to bring us up to date very quickly about well, what's really happening uh, in the year 2003. Uh, stratification means layers, and W. Lloyd Warner went to a small Midwestern town, and he wanted to find out how people there classified each other. And what he found was that he had a six-step classification system. And normally this is thought of, thought of as a class system. Class system ideally means you have unlimited potential for mobility up or down, depending on what you achieve yourself. Well, of course, we know there's lots of other factors involved in that. There are some people that are born into uh, poverty that have a hell of a time getting out. Caste refers to a system where you're born into it and you can't get out of it. You may achieve, but you achieve within the boundaries of that particular caste system. What I'd like to argue is a little different than your book argues. I'll argue that W. Lloyd Warner really didn't describe a pure class system, but a combination class caste system. I'll argue that the upper, upper class is really a caste. You can't earn your way into it no matter how much money you make. And I'll argue that to some degree the lower, lower class is caste-like. You can get out of it and people do, but the vast majority of people born into the lower, lower caste class have real trouble getting out of it. So if we look at uh, the idea of class, Max Weber defined it not as just money. So we can't just measure people's income and say you belong in this class, bang, you belong in that class. Because some people in higher classes will have less money than some people in lower classes. That seems counterintuitive. So he says it's not only money, but it's power, the ability to get done what you want done, the influence you have in the community, and prestige, how highly you're thought of by others. So class is determined, according to Mark's favor, by power, uh, prestige, and money. Now, W. Lloyd Warner looked at six classes in a Midwestern city. Let's see how similar it is to what you know about your city, your town, or Springfield, or wherever you're talking about. The first one is, is not hard to remember at all because it's the upper, upper class. This is a group of people, and the key thing to remember here is old money. You and I could go out and turn Lake Springfield water into gasoline tomorrow by some wild invention, and we could have the most money in the world, like Bill Gates, and we wouldn't be a member of the upper, upper class. Bill Gates is one of the richest men in the world, perhaps the richest, depending on the day of the week. He's not a member of the upper, upper class. It's old money, and that means at least three generations. Now, you can get your money dirty, like the Rockefellers, like the Kennedys. Uh, but within three generations, if you do the right things, contribute to the right charities, marry the right people, your grandchildren might be considered upper, upper class. Um, these people have large families. And of all the classes except the lowest class, they're the most likely to have multi-generations living in the same household. Um, John Kennedy was not considered upper, upper class until he married Jacqueline Bouvier. She didn't have much money, but she had the old family name, and together he had the money, she had the prestige. Together they, that was what kind of finalized the Kennedys as being members of the upper, upper class. This group of people is uh, not the people that are the showiest with their money. They're not the people that you might see in fancy subdivisions in your area, for example, at Panther Creek or something of that nature. They probably are two classes down by and large. These are the people that have the power behind the community oftentimes, behind decisions. These are the people that really have strong influence in the community. Uh, they often don't run for public office. The Rockefellers and Kennedys are exceptions to that. Usually they're the ones who pick the people who run for public office. All right. The next group are the lower upper class. And now we're getting the people we call just rich. This is how the upper, upper class refers to them. That's new money. Might be nice to be just rich, but these are the people like Bill Gates, people who haven't had money for generations, but have earned it in their lifetime. They're often very hardworking people. They've often come up with some new product or they've uh, come up with some new business product or practice or something of that nature. These people also have strong ties on family, just as the upper, upper class do. 
they're often showy in their wealth. They're often really interested in impressing you that they're really rich and what they can do with it. So they're the ones that often live most ostentatiously. Uh, they're a power in the community as well. They have quite a bit of influence. The next, and that these two groups together, by the way, the lower upper and the upper upper, how much of the population do you think they make? In the 1940s, they made less than 1% of the population. Has that gotten better or, or worse or different in, since the 1940s? Has the money become more concentrated in that group or has it become less concentrated? We'll take a look at that in a little bit. The third group, we've only covered 1% of the population. We've covered a huge amount of the wealth. The third group is the upper middle class. And the upper middle class make up about uh, 9 to 10 percent of the population. And these are the people we typically think of in the fancy suburbs and, and uh, that have new money as well. They tend to have professional degrees like medical doctor, pharmacist, stock uh, brokers, um, real estate brokers as opposed to real estate agents, things of that nature. These people are, have values on education, obviously, hard work. And in, a, in an area like Springfield, Illinois, this would be a group that you'd see most likely on uh, boards of trustees. They'd be most likely uh, on boards of trustees of the University of Illinois at Springfield or even Lincoln Lane Community College. Uh, these people are considered wealthy at the local level, but notice they're three classes down. Now we've made maybe 11%, we've covered maybe 11% of the population and we've covered the vast majority of the wealth already. Again, I'm going to ask you later, is that different now, all these years later, 60 years later? Is it pretty much the same or has it gotten more uh, separated? All right, let's look at the lower middle class. Now you haven't gotten to the class I was born into yet, and it's not this class either. The lower middle class are people who are uh, white collar workers. They get paid monthly, as opposed to paid by the hour. Uh, they often include uh, some blue collar workers that would include plumbers who are very well paid if they're highly skilled, electricians, but not most blue collar workers. Most blue collar workers would fit in the next class down. This group makes up about 40% of the population. 40% of the population. So four out of 10 people would fit the lower middle class. And I mentioned I didn't grow up in this class. And we talk about uh, teasing people about growing up in trailers. Uh, my family, my mother and father and my brother and I lived in a trailer that was 8 foot wide and 24 foot long when I was born. My mom and dad literally came out of the carnival. They worked in the carnival as photographers for uh, a couple of years, rent a laundry truck. So they fit in the upper and lower class. And in no way does, do I see this one class as being better than the other necessarily. Uh, I've gotten lots of values of hard work and, and things of that nature from this blue collar background. This is the upper and lower class. And I'm very proud of that, that blue collar background. So blue collar workers, hourly wage, um, again, hard workers, a lot of church members, active in churches. Very seldom would people from this group get to be on boards of trustees and run educational institutions or, or uh, things of that nature. The upper and lower class makes up 40% uh, of the population as well. So now we've covered 80% of the population in the lower middle and the upper lower. We've covered most of the population. What do we have left? We have left the lower lower class. And this is the group that, oddly enough, I would argue is more caste-like, similar to the upper upper class. Most people in the lower lower class are born into it. And the lower lower class uh, are the last hired because they have the least skills. 
That's one of the concerns about the digital divide that your author talks about and whether they get computer training or not. And when things go bad, they're the first fired. So when recessions happen, these people get hurt the worst and are out of work the longest, have the least amount saved, if any. And uh, things get tight. And these are hardworking people, too. Oftentimes, contrary to popular uh, statements, some of these people are unemployed, of course. But some of these people that I've met when I was a probation officer in the inner city of Kansas City were working two and three jobs at lousy wages. We now call those MAC jobs uh, that paid almost nothing, and, and they were just in trouble all the time. And I don't mean in criminal trouble, I mean in trouble financially, trying to keep a family together. Uh, these people have the highest rates of apathy, least likely to vote. So lots of uh, lots of uh, political parties will take their vote for granted it's been argued that the democratic party uh, counts on the lower upper lower class and the lower lower class for votes and that they promise all kinds of things but for this particular class since they vote so seldom they don't really have to deliver much so they talk big and get some votes and they don't have to deliver a whole lot is often the argument um, why would they be so apathetic well if you think about it they don't have a lot of hope for the future so they lack hope Oftentimes, and of course, we're talking about the average person, not everybody. And there, if you lack hope, even when opportunities come around, you're less likely to take advantage of those opportunities. They also have the highest belief in astrology. Now, what's the connection there? Well, the belief that, that the stars control my future, not that I control my future. If you go to the classes above this, they're more likely people to say, you know, I control my future. I control a lot of what happens. This group people are born into, does anyone ever make it out of? Yeah, but is it as easy for them to make it out of that as it was for me to make it out of the upper lower class? Not at all. I had lots of opportunities that would never be presented to these people. So if we look at all this, this is a 1940s study, and how much has changed? I go into great detail, your author goes into some wonderful detail on this, but let me just give you a couple of figures that shows you how stratified we remain. In fact, in many ways, I would argue that we were more stratified than we were in the past. One figure, just real quickly, is that 80% of the wealth in America owned in 2003 by the top 20% of the population. What does the bottom 20% have? Bottom. 20%, in other words, the lower, lower class, the bottom 20% have a negative 1% of the wealth. In other words, they're in debt. If you look at all the currency stores and check cashing stores running around, you wonder how in the world can they make money. Lots of folks are just on the edge, barely making a paycheck to paycheck. A medical emergency comes up, this comes up, that comes up, and it's really hard. Now, these are two figures that are powerful. 80% of the wealth in America is owned by 20% of the population. In another segment, we'll take a look at, is that good or is that bad? Of course, some sociologists would argue that's good because it motivates people. Others would say it's bad because it creates hostility. One other, two other figures I'd like to share with you that kind of gives striking uh, comparisons here. In 1960, if you look at CEOs, chief executive officers, they made on an average of 41 times the salary of an average factory worker. Now, I, I could argue that it's not that dramatic. They have tremendous responsibility. They work their butts off. They work more than 40 hours a week. But by 1997, the most recent data I have on this topic, that figure had written, risen to 360 times the average factory worker. In other words, we've seen an Enron mentality of scam as much as you can. Take everything you can and to hell with people's pensions, to hell with the workers, and if I have to lay off lots of people, so be it. Uh, I would argue, and you can see by the passion coming out there, I'd argue that we've made some steps backwards here, that this is not good for a stable country. Other sociologists might argue differently, and I'll share that in the, the next section here.
Thank you.